Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Angela Chan, who's going to be leading the session. Angela Chan is an independent curator, artist and researcher. As a creative climate change communicator, she collaborates widely with artists, activists, speculative fiction authors and youth groups. Angela creates curatorial and workshop projects as Worm Art and Ecology. And through her research-based art practice, Angela is a commissioned artist for Jerwood Arts, Fax Digital Fellowship, Metal Estuary 2021 and Sonic Act Overexposed Environmental Research Residency. Angela also co-founded the London Chinese Science Fiction Group and co-directs the London Science Fiction Research Community. She holds a joint honours undergraduate degree in history of art and a Scandinavian studies, UCL, and an MA in climate change history, culture and society. So without any further ado, Angela, please do take it away. Thank you so much for introducing me and to everyone to, um, who's joining after a day. And um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to um, introduce to you a little bit about what I do and also the activities that um, we'll get up to together um, later on. So I'm going to share my screen and once that is um, on view, someone can let me know and then I'll kind of give you um, an insight of my work first and then I'll bring um, our activities and looking through some of the objects in the Barber's collection and think about environmental and climate issues um, through these objects. Um, so what I'll begin with is to kind of explain what I do in terms of like being a creative climate change communicator and so I kind of predominantly work as um, a curator under the name Worm Art and Ecology and so since about 2014 I've been um, interviewing different creative practitioners so they might be artists, researchers, um, people who work with the community to ask them how do you work with um, environmental and climate um, change themes and how do you how do you relate to people with these creative um, vocabularies and presentations? Um, and it's built up to become something that's like a curatorial project, which means that I make exhibitions. Um, I also give talks like this one and workshops. Um, I work with youth groups and sometimes I give um, university lectures as well. And so, where my ecology started off as something that's online, which is something you can see on this um, page. And so through those kind of um, projects in exhibition spaces with galleries and also kind of with working with workshops and youth groups, it's become something also that's offline and in person. But again, this year it's kind of gone back to something that's online. Um, Something that I always also do with my um, interest in climate change research is that I produce arts projects um, through kind of what I call like a research based practice. So in this way, I kind of investigate a specific climate or environmental issue um, by researching it. And sometimes this means gathering um, interviews and making videos with people concerned with those um, environmental um, and climate issues. And I also write speculative or science fiction to go alongside it to kind of illustrate um, a bigger picture of what I'm um, looking at. So some of the current projects that I'm researching and making arts projects um, about um, includes this project called Moss Rain Paradox, which is actually in reference to um, a recent environmental agency supported report um, called the Great British Rain Paradox, which kind of says that, oh, most people in Britain don't think that there's a water scarcity issue in the UK because it rains so much here. So I think about, you know, our climate's understanding through what we see and what we don't see, but also how the public learns about um, different and changing um, climate related issues. Um, some upcoming research projects that I'm doing also 
um, kind of think about the landscape of the UK and the actual um, environmental impacts of the industry. So specifically working um, on a Thames Estuary Festival, looking at the um, explosives factories that used to function there and think about um, a global trade of um, munitions. Um, and then this leads on to a research project that I'll do next year that um, actually investigates um, the current and historical use of tear gas, um, which is a chemical weapon used against um, citizens who are usually um, lawfully um, protesting. And it's I'm concerned with the environmental impacts of it um, when it's kind of attempted to be cleaned up by the authorities, but a lot of the residues get, um, I guess, washed away into the water systems. So what are the long-term effects of this kind of pollution? That's what I'm interested in. Um, and I also have this interest in science fiction and I read a lot in translation. So in English, but also translated from um, different languages around the world. Um, I think it's really exciting to think about um, climate change and any kind of social or political issues through a different way of um, storytelling because it allows us to imagine at a really full capacity and explore issues that maybe kind of don't fit into our real world um, scales of time or place or like geographies. And um, I feel that science and speculative fiction is a really um, I guess approachable and um, expansive way to engage in conversation with other people as well. It, sometimes we think that reading is a very solitary act, but I think that reading and discussing stories is something that we can do um, with a lot of fun with other people. So I kind of um, got interested in SF, science and speculative fictions, um, as a way to understand climate change issues in a more creative way. So um, from this, you can see um, the London science fiction research community um, kind of recent conference, um, which I co-direct with nine others, actually, it's quite a big group. And we're based at Birkbeck University, London. And then the London Chinese science fiction group that I've been um, running as a co-director with my friend Guan Zhou um, for about a year and a half. And we're based at UCL. Um, so I write and also kind of uh, organize these reading groups that are monthly, which I welcome you to join. So I hope that gives you a very brief insight into some of the ways that we can explore climate change and environmental issues um, through creative activities and practices. Um, and what I kind of want to, I guess, um, introduce or kind of um, clarify with you is that there's a difference between environmental and climate change um, in terms of environmental is a kind of a more immediate shorter term environmental as a kind of more local happening um, kind of uh, I guess situation whereas climate change is something that's a, an overall very global over a long amount of time we, we start talking about geological time in this sense so uh, one way of thinking about it is that environmental concerns kind of recognizable weather kind of daily differences, whereas climate change is something that is a very long term discussion. And so how do we kind of think about these issues in our creative practices? Um, these are kind of four points that um, guide my way of thinking and the way that I kind of try to also be um, informed by the evolving discussions that are always coming up in climate science and also climate activism and um, different types of, I guess, um, communal and community level um, knowledges um, that add to the conversation. And so I look at intersectional perspectives, which means that um, we are kind of, I guess, getting a cross section. We're looking at all of the layers that um, make an impact to climate change. And this could be through um, race, class, gender, um, LGBTQIA plus kind of community um, conversations, um, as well as thinking about um, different disabilities and how this um, impacts the way that we can participate 
in talking about these issues, but also participate in, I guess, what's related to this session is talking about art and talking about climate change and how we move in these spaces that might not necessarily welcome people from different backgrounds. Um, and I kind of think about integrated knowledges in a sense that we are open and we are very ready to listen to each other. And so we need many different types of knowledges. We can't all be experts in everything. So it's about co-creating as in working together to find a kind of solution or many solutions that we can move forward with. And I think about inclusive storytelling, which um, again, places emphasis on being open with each other. And some of the work that I do with youth groups is saying that, okay, so history tells us that, you know, X, Y, and Z has happened that has led to the climate crisis, but um, the future is still unwritten and you have the capacity and the agency to write your own ending and this is what inclusive storytelling to me looks like. It's saying that, okay, you have the agency, um, pick up the pen, think about the things that make you feel like you're included in the discussion. And so all of these, well, three kind of approaches I use as a way to, I guess, inform the way that I make artwork and talk with um, people of the, from the public that is aligned with the climate justice activism um, that is happening. So climate justice is also a combination of social justice in the way that we think about climate issues and activism. And so I kind of hope that that gives a, a brief kind of overview of the approaches that we can start thinking about in the way um, that we, uh, I guess, experience the artworks and um, works in the Barber collection. And so I guess I'll kind of just say something about what we hope to achieve together. And it's a very kind of, um, I guess, experimental, it's a very relaxed way of exploring together. There's not an emphasis for you to, you know, or to be experts in climate change and the arts by the end of this. But I really hope that we can find ways of kind of finding our own vocabulary to start talking more comfortably, more confidently, and more, I guess, collaboratively um, on these issues. So one of the aims is to expand our perspectives. And I think that this is, um, I guess, yeah, opening up our different ways of understanding different backgrounds and how they inform our um, understandings of climate issues, um, but also contextualize the histories. So we, we're going to be approaching historical objects and artworks, and they're from a very certain era of our history. And so we can learn from this and we can also kind of um, attribute our own experiences um, and uh, kind of build up our own kind of narrations of our understandings, kind of find ways that we can relate to these objects and these ideas and maybe kind of explain maybe why they do or they don't um, support our kind of current day views and so that's yes that's part of the kind of workshop aims and so very briefly we'll return to these primary themes later but very briefly before we go into the kind of uh, objects themselves I want us to have in our minds um, these three themes histories of people power and the environment and how these objects um, relate to our cl current climate issues. And so have these kind of thoughts at the back of your mind whilst I go through the objects with you. And so I'd like to introduce um, five pieces that I've been looking at um, in the Barber collection. And um, so the first of and on all of these, actually, I should mention, all of these I feel relate to environmental and climate issues and are kind of pieces that we can, uh, I guess, learn quite a lot from, even though they um, might not directly speak to these themes. And so firstly, we have David Lucas's The Lock, and it's kind of depicting um, a man who's waiting for the water levels in the lock 
to drop so that he can move forward um, more downstream. And um, this print is depicting the lock at Flatford Mill in Suffolk. And the artist is actually kind of giving quite a nice nostalgic romantic feel to the piece. Um, but we can also consider that at this time, this piece was made at, um, you know, at the height of the industrial revolution in the UK. It was produced in 1834. And around this time, you know, a lot of the rural places were modernizing, cities were actually quite full. And, you know, by the middle of the 19th century in Britain, actually 23% um, of, of the UK was involved in global industrial production. And so British workers were actually the richest in Europe at that time. And not many of them worked on the land, many of them worked in factories and in industry, um, but yet the artist chooses to present quite an idyllic, harmonious, pleasant um, kind of picture of the environment um, of the countryside. So we can start to also kind of think about um, the situation itself that is on a waterway and we might later on in our activity pay attention to how the waterways in the UK actually paved way to industry and trade further afield. And then secondly, um, I'd like to, us to pay attention to this piece as Vesuvius in Eruption by Joseph Wright of Derby. Um, I accidentally put um, the numbers wrong on the date, please excuse that. Um, and this is actually one of around 30 oil paintings that the artist produced after, you know, a few years vacation in Italy. But when he was there, he didn't actually see Vesuvius erupt. So we can take this piece as a bit of a kind of speculative fantasy that the artist produced on his arrival arrival back at home. So what does it kind of, um, you know, say to us that he's fascinated by this, um, I guess, geologic landscape? And how does an eruption affect the immediate um, ecologies, including the people who live around this area? And I think it's kind of um, quite interesting for us to see quite a lot of, I guess, um, news media about wildfires recently, especially this year in California, as well as Australia. What does it say to kind of, you know, dig up this piece that's from hundreds of years ago, but say actually the imagery of disaster is something that we can relate to every day with, with this. And then I've also included Miss Clara, who is, um, which in this model is about kind of the size of a small cat, I, su I suppose, um, just to give you a frame of reference because it's sometimes hard to tell with digital, digital images. Um, so Miss Clara, who was christened with this name, um, was a young Indian um, rhinoceros that was brought over by a Dutch sea captain um, to the Netherlands around 1741. And she became quite a bit of a celebrity in, on the continent, touring the whole of Europe. And um, I guess it's quite interesting because a lot of people around that time hadn't seen a rhinoceros before in real life. And so it must have been a very shocking, but also spectacular kind of experience to, to see one. Um, but it kind of, when we look at this piece today, it might bring up kind of ethical concerns of what does it mean to tour an animal like this where the zoo is actually a movie okay angela i think is having some just connections issues there just bear with us one second Um, so I was mentioning that um, it gives us ethical concerns nowadays to think about, um, I guess, like animal cruelty, maybe, and what it means to take um, living beings, whether it's animals or people, because we need to remember that the British Empire took um, a lot of um, people and animals, as well as raw materials, such as minerals from 
stolen lands. And this, I guess, moves us to um, this piece um, by an unknown artist. Um, and this is a piece that kind of speaks to us through religion and mythology. Um, it is a piece owned by the royal family um, as a dedication to the queen mother of the Benin Empire. And um, to me, I kind of included this um, with our collection of items um, because it's interesting that the um, animals are used as a kind of, um, I guess, symbolic, um, oh, sorry. Is my internet connection okay? Yes, great, sorry, I got a notification on my screen. Um, is used as a symbolic, um, I guess, like uh, icon for rituals in this culture. And I feel that it's important also to say that this was stolen from Benin in 1897, when British troops actually invaded um, the city and took many thousands of objects um, away. And these are held in museums um, in, in different geographies. And the barber is having um, some conversations that are really timely, really important to be having about what um, colonialism um, has done to kind of shape museums as we know it. Um, so I think in, in the later discussion of the activities, this will kind of be explored further as well. Um, and I guess in relation to kind of how we see this um, today, like we need to acknowledge that in West Africa, this is a real hotspot for climate change um, devastation. And that um, the warming across this area of the world is actually greater than the global average warming. And um, quite significantly, um, a member of state has, has said that, you know, two degrees rise globally is actually a certain death for millions of Africans. And that's the, I guess the UN and policy making doesn't quite reflect the injustice that is happening across um, different regions of the world. And then lastly, I bring our attention to this really colorful print by Joan Miro, and it's called, um, in translation, Help Spain. And so it depicts um, a, far a Catalan farmer with a very big fist against, in protest against um, the fascists who were attacking um, Spain's Republican government. And the writing at the bottom um, translates along the lines of um, how the fascists are a spent force um, and kind of opposed to people, are opposed to, you know, our values that we hold. And um, the creative determination will surprise the world. And so it's kind of like a call to arms um, as a very kind of climate activist piece, even though it's from, you know, an area that we rarely think about as a kind of... A, you know, a decade of activism um, in terms of climate related issues. But in 1937, this is, you know, something that um, was really kind of, I guess, something that repeats in history. I want to bring up that, you know, across the weekend, London was shut down by road blockages with um, Sikh and Kisan farmers um, in India um, who are calling for solidarity around the world. Um, against what is happening to them um, who are being exploited by the state. And so um, I guess like in the UK, finding solidarities with different parts of the world in climate change activism is really important. Um, we think about kind of farmers um, as, as kind of, sorry, um, we need to understand that farmers are actually being exploited very severely around the world. And closer to home, we need to understand also that Brexit is bringing its own kind of whole kind of, I guess, kind of. Hello, is my internet okay? Great. Um, our last point was that um, closer to home, we need to think about and be aware of how Brexit is already impacting the way that we have um, rights for farmers in the UK in the sense that um, the food regulations are kind of going to be deregulated um, as a result of Brexit. This is a, a refusal of the amendments of the agricultural bill that happened 
I think about a month and a half or two months ago. And the deregulation of um, food standards means that pesticides will be used more in the foods. Um, but this actually has a very global impact because um, a lot of farmers around the world, especially in developing countries, were kind of seeing EU regulations as a reason to, to use more organic farming methods. But the deregulation is going to um, cause uh, corporations to sell more pesticides, and this is going to affect more of the farmers who don't have the proper um, health and safety kind of um, precautions um, to protect them from pesticides. And so I kind of return all of these images into kind of like a activity after the break. And so of these five, I've selected these three um, pieces for us to focus on. And um, I guess kind of like remembering the histories of people, power and the environment and how these relate to our climate issues today will kind of start to unpack um, these specific pieces. Um, and so I'll explain a bit more about the activity after the session break. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. So many different themes uh, being brought together in all of those different artworks to kind of think about. We thought this would be a good time for you to have five minutes, digest all of that, maybe get yourselves a drink. And when we come back, we'll talk about how we're going to share and discuss this together. So if we meet back here at 1835 and we'll get started. Thanks. <laughs> 